Welcome back to the 43rd Ryder Cup here at Whistling Straits. We are with Paul Casey. Paul, welcome to your fifth career uh, Ryder Cup. Uh, you're one of the few, there's not many, but who've been here f now for the fourth time. Uh, three PGAs and obviously this Ryder Cup. You had a, your best finish was a T12 in 2010. I, I wonder if you might be able to go back to 04 and, and tell us your initial impressions of this golf course and maybe how that, your thoughts have maybe evolved over the course of time a little bit. I don't know. I think I probably only played two rounds in 04, didn't I? Don't remember. You've got the results. Um, I, don't, I don't remember my initial impressions. I mean, I would have, like I am today, I would have been wowed. I mean, this, this place is spectacular. Um, what a creation. It's a brilliant golf course. Always been a Pete Dye fan. Um, I'll admit my, my memories, my knowledge of the course, I think, is strong. My, my memories of, or my knowledge of my results has been weak, because that year in 2010, Christian Donald was on my bag, who's on the team for us this week and the support staff. And I had to ask him, I, th do we, I said, did we play two rounds? He goes, no, you finished 12th. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which is great to hear, because it means I can play this golf course, obviously, relatively well. Um, I mean, 12th, not, obviously not right at the pointy end, but it wasn't bad. Um, but yeah, to this day, spectacular, love it. Um, what a challenge, and I think it's a great golf course for this week. Terrific, thank you for that. Uh, let's begin here, Rex at four, please. Paul, it looked like you guys had a pretty interesting, at least nine hole alternate shot match. Are there any details you can give us about that from yesterday? Um, we explored the property um, greatly. Um, lots of birdies, Poulter and, and um, Rory throwing in eagles as well. Um, details from it? No, we're just trying stuff out. Um, honestly, when it got as windy as it did yesterday, we thought foursomes was the best thing to do. Um, I think we all, I think everybody was struggling out there a little bit. Poulter played very well on the front nine. I think he was three under on his own golf ball. Um, I struggled in the wind a little bit, and so foursomes was just the thing to do. Um, plus, just being a long day, we just it sped things up a little bit. Um, no, to be honest, I mean, you've seen, I think we've confused a few people on the first tee, throwing the golf balls up on the tee. Nobody knows what's going on on the outside, it looks like, which is kind of part of the fun we have. But for us, it was, I mean, myself paired up with Lee, um, the most experienced guy here. No, we were just out there playing and getting ready for a big day tomorrow. And it, just to, as a follow-up to that, is it maybe it's statistically, if you can look at the Americans' record in alternate shot, it's not great in this event. Is there anything to the fact that you just seem to, the Europeans seem to enjoy it a little bit more, maybe embrace it better? I don't know what the best way is. I, I, I don't know. I've, I, I've never spent too much time looking at it. I mean, I think the British guys always spent a lot of time playing foursomes as kids. Um, it's just something we did in matches. It was always foursomes in the morning and singles in the afternoon. It's just something you do in club matches, county matches, even up to the um, international level. Um, I don't believe there's any sort of tricks and tips or anything. It's just something I think we're a bit more used to. Um, I mean, there's certain golf clubs in the UK where foursomes is a thing. You have to play foursomes if you want to go play. Um, um, no, I don't know what to tell you. All right. All right, let's go right next door, number three. Uh, hey, Paul, you've been a part of four teams, and I thought it was interesting to see that most of them were blowouts. Three, three in your favor, one against. I mean, they were lopsided in the end, at least. Um, and I was curious, is it possible at this point in the week to get a feeling of how the week is going to go, or is it always sort of a surprise that you don't know until points start coming in? It's a surprise. I think, I mean, looking back at, um, there was some, there was a rerun of Oakland Hills on TV earlier this week that I saw, and we were just going through the office in our area. Um, and um, it was my match with David Howe against, oh, goodness, that Furican, oh, I'd have to look at that. I can tell you right now. Uh, Stuart Sink? No, it was that Johnson. Friday's matches in the morning. It was, it was Saturday, Saturday morning at Oakland Saturday Hills. Saturday morning. I apologize for not pulling that. But uh, at the Furic, time. Furic and Campbell. Thank you. Yep. Um, we were 6-2 down or six, or whatever it was. It was 6.5, 2.5, whatever the score was. I mean, it was like, it was very, very lopsided the other way. And that was a big point and then things turned and then I think Westwood and Clarkie and Monty and those guys went out in the afternoon and had a great session and then and then 
that result ended up being our biggest victory, biggest margin of victory in the US at that point. Never have known that on a Saturday morning. Um, so. Six and a half to one. <laughs> to oh, were we? To one and a half, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Oh, we were already. Yeah, you, were, you were up big. Oh, we were already up big. Yeah. No. Yeah, six and a half to one and a half Europe after, after the Friday. Oh, I got that totally wrong then, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go for another question. <laughs> <laughs> just scrap all that, that last three minutes. Are you sure that was a round of clock? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, do you, is there a feeling beforehand of how it's going to go, or is it always no, a surprise on Friday? It's always a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're getting a jitsy. I have no clue. Like, I don't remember anything. I don't remember from last, last week. Would you save them, Phil, please? Uh, I'll try. Good morning, Mr. Casey. Um, uh, there was a 10-year gap, obviously, between your previous 2008-2018. Uh, um, how pleasing is it to have qualified again straight away for this one? Yeah, it's a um, much nicer place than having to wait for a pick and all that. Um, actually, to be announced, even, there was mathematically in, was a nice thing um, during the week of Wentworth. Um, yeah, it's... it's look, I, I was... There was a time pre Paris when I thought I'd never, I might never play another Ryder Cup, um, having you know missed a couple, more than a couple. Um, I was quite emotional in Paris because that was because of that gap and you know the level, the, for, the form I'd been through, and um, uh, to be part of that great team in Paris was just um, has been one of the, the most special moments of my career. The fact it was a pick made me sort of nervous, kind of coming down the, the last few weeks. This one, I felt uh, I felt much more comfortable. It's actually, I've, I've, as much as I wanted to be on this team, I put it to the side. The thought of trying to qualify, it's just been a sort of organic process and a result of the good golf I've played. Um, and now I'm even looking at Westy going, how many more can I kind of play? I think Westy is maybe the oldest European to represent, it's the oldest player to represent Europe, I think 48 or whatever he is now. Um, and so I'm 44, thinking, can I squeeze a couple more out? It's amazing how the my sort of my view on it has changed. Um, gone from maybe never, that's it, maybe I'm done, to um, you know, what does the future hold? But in the meantime, yeah, this week, brilliant. I mean, it's it's been an absolute joy. So the whole process from the qualification to here I am on a, on a Thursday, um, couldn't have been better. What would it mean to, to win potentially here this week? Would it make up for missing out on the Olympic medal, perhaps? Uh, that's a different thing. But um, for me, the Olympics were very, not to get too much away from Ryder Cup, the Olympics were very, very special. And as much as I would love a medal, um, what a moment. And to play with Xander um, and Hideki, final group, um, that's something that people, only people who have been at Olympics will understand. And that experience of being in the village that's something I will cherish forever. And it doesn't, the not having a medal doesn't, it doesn't lessen it in any way. Um, that would be the cherry on the, on the top of the cream kind of thing. But uh, no, the Olympics is, is pretty cool. What, 20? Hey, Paul. Um, can you describe uh, what Pulse means to to Europe, Europe Ryder Cup, and do you have any idea what makes him tick? Can you put your could you put your finger on what makes him tick and why he's so successful? I don't know what makes him tick. I mean, he is he is unique. Uh, he's 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 a big majority of the glue for this team. Um, <coughs> he is just he's like the we don't lack energy, we don't lack glue. We we'll always be a a very unified team, um, even uh, even those teams when he's he's not been there or he's been there as a you know I think he was a Hazel Tina you know as an assistant captain, um, you know yeah we have we have everything already he just adds to it so much more. Um, I have no idea what makes him tick, but all I know is it's very very special. It's infectious. Um, I mean, you, you see some of it on the outside. You, I guess you see a lot of it. You don't see what we get to see in the team room and in the locker room. And this morning he's just rolled through and it's just, you just see that bounce in the step. And it, um, yeah, I hope he continues 
to play Ryder Cup. So I hope he beats Westy's record of, of how long he goes um, because he's a massive part of our team. Um, Just as a quick follow on that, if you are an opponent of his, if you're the U.S. side, can you appreciate how maybe, I don't know what the word is, whether it's annoying, agitating, under the skin, whatever, N not that he's trying to be a bad guy, but just kind of, you know, the way, you know, when he gets on a roll and he's got the bug eyes going and all that kind of thing. Yeah, look, I, look, all the, I think, I don't know how well all the U.S. guys know him, but the one, you know, certainly Dustin, these guys who know him for years, I mean, they, they love him. And they certainly want to, if there's anybody they want to play and have the opportunity to beat, it's Poulter, without question. I mean, he's made his mark as he's sort of missed a Ryder Cup. Um, you know, it's, it's that opportunity, isn't it? What an opportunity to go up against Poulter. Um, I wouldn't want to play him. Um, glad he's on my team. Doug, 24, hey, please. Paul, it, it seems like uh, over the years you watch Europe during the week and there's a lot of joy, you mentioned, a lot of fun, a lot of looseness, and, and Friday morning gets here and it's, it's all business, all purpose. Can you, is that true? And is there, can you talk about this and kind of the sensation of, of how the week shifts and how the, how, the, how the switch flips when you get to Friday morning? Um, I don't think our, our switch flips that much, as much as you think. It's, there's still a lot of fun and, and uh, humor and... and Look, we're going to have a great time this week no matter what. Um, it just ramps up. I think that maybe there are a few, a few less smiles that are visible that are shown, but we're still trying to have the, the time of our life and play amazing golf. Um, yeah, I don't think, it's a, don't think it's a switch that flips. Um, it wouldn't work, I don't think, Doug, if that were the case. You know, the whole week is we're very serious in our preparation. Um, we're methodical, attention to detail. Um, we try to leave no stone unturned because we know the margins are so small. Um, you know, you can look at world rankings and all these things, but we all know, you know, it's, it's, it could be down to one putt or um, a, fraction, you know, a fraction of a shot every day that's going to make the difference. But we don't, um, it doesn't suddenly become, it's serious all week. And I, th I guess we probably try to maybe deflect a little in a way, having humor. Um, I still think it will be there come tomorrow. It's just maybe not as visible. Thank you. Eight, Daniel. Eight. Compared, compared to the, sorry, compared to the uh, other teams that you've played on, how how would you describe Parig's uh, leadership style and the the dynamic within within this team? Because it seems like an interesting mix of, of guys who have done this for a long time and, and some younger guys. Uh, I, I think firstly the dynamic the dynamic is brilliant. We've this is. Um, Try. Um, I don't like to compare teams and say one's, you know, uh, this team's a, you know, better than a other team I've played on, but this team as a, as a unified team is, is so strong. Um, I mean, it's broad in its, in its age range um, experience, but I mean, what, I'm proud to be standing next to my 11 teammates and captain and vice captains. I mean, there is, we have such a unified team going and Paddy has been um, a major role in that because you can have brilliant teams and maybe not have and be slightly rudderless but um, I've been utterly impressed with Paddy's captaincy um, his communication skills have been top notch um, and, and a relaxed air to everything we do but a serious approach at the same time um, yeah we we, we as you know, we tend not to say what goes on behind closed doors, but it's been an, from, this is my fifth. Um, it gets better and better every single time. Really quick, 30 seconds, last question, six. Paul, you mentioned uh, dropping balls on the first tee and people from the outside potentially not knowing what you're doing. And if you listen to Talking Heads, there's probably about 30 different partnerships that Europe could have, <laughs> while Stricker has basically telegraphed what he's been trying to do since day one. Is that intentional on the European side to kind of throw up some smoke screens? No, no, it's not. It's just, um, um, you know, we, we, well, I know kind of roughly what I'm doing. Uh, I actually couldn't tell you what the rest of the, the matchups might look like starting tomorrow. Um, no, it's not, it's not um, trying to smoke, throw smoke screens or, or um, you know, throw a kind of dummy or a fake out there. Not at all. It's just, 
you know, I think we're, we're, we're so good, we're so comfortable of what we're going to do come tomorrow. It's like, well, why, you know, why overthink it on a, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday? Um, you'll, again, I know my pairing, um, possible pairings. It's, again, up to Paddy, what he decides to do. They're not in the envelope or however it works yet. Um, but I'll still be throwing up on the, the ball on the first tee later today. Matt, welcome to your second career Ryder Cup. Um, second on the road here. I, I'm just curious about your comfort level. Is there uh, a greater, uh, more elaborate sense of comfort here this year as opposed to when you were a rookie in 16? They're both on the road, so that's a little bit of a different uh, twist too. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a few things. My, my game um, I didn't feel like was as good as it is now then. Um so I feel like it's uh, it's much better now nowadays, and and my game's definitely changed a lot, uh, hitting it further and, and various other things. Um, I also think just knowing the guys in the in the European team team better. Um, I'd only had had my card in fifteen and sixteen, so I only got to spend a little bit of time with the guys on the team and um, other players during you know regular weeks on tour. So um, now it's been. This is my eighth year, I think, on tour, so I know I know everyone really well now. So um, I think that makes a big difference, you know, being able to uh, feel comfortable going, you know, just talking uh, about anything with them, really. So okay, let's hit the ground for some questions. That is number three, back right. Hey, Matt. Um, not looking for a specific name, but I'm curious. Do you have a sense right now of who you're going to play with whenever you're going to play? Um, and if the answer is yes, when did you know that by? Yeah, I mean, you know, we um we get a feel of of who who we're going to play with by you know, who we're playing with in the groups and stuff, I guess. And um but uh the communication's been great all week. Um I've had plenty of conversations with with the vices and 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 Paddy. Um so I I think uh early doors that um he told us all that we you know, he, he wanted to make sure that that we knew where we stood going into the week, and and um, that's I think that's been uh, really valuable uh, um, for for everyone really. Just a quick to put you on the spot, you do know exactly in your whatever your first match is going to be, you know that, and you know who your partner will be. Yeah, great. <laughs> you can tell us if you like. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be the one to uh, th <laughs> throw Paddy under the bus. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, we are going to Daniel eight. From the outside, it seems like it's hard to have more different golf courses than, than Hazeltine and Whistling Straits. I'm curious, from inside the ropes, how different is this test versus the one you faced five years ago? Yeah, m massively. Um, I tried to forget Hazel time, Hazeltine pretty quickly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how much I remember it. Um, but uh, it is it's very, very different. Um there wasn't much penalty for really, really wide shots at, um, in 2016, whereas here the, there is there is a penalty. Um, you know, you, you've got the lake down most holes and you've got random bushes in bunkers and bunkers that you didn't even know existed. So um, it's definitely a different test. And, and obviously you've got the, the added added wind as well. So um, the golf course is... is much better than than I thought it was going to be um, for for myself. Um, so yeah, I, I was uh, really pleased to to see that it, it wasn't similar to 16. Kind of going off that, you know, Stricker in his explanation for his captain's picks talked a lot about driving distance. How the stats said that that was really important on this golf course. Are, are you getting that sense that it's like a bomber's course? Uh, I think there's obviously a handful of holes where it, it'd be nice to just carry it 340 through the air. Um, but I wouldn't say it's like massive. It's not sort of glaringly obvious, um, in my opinion. Um, I, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think it, I think it's a second shot golf course. Personally, um, I think you know you got to hit it and get it in position off the tee, and then that gives you a chance to use the slopes on the green to move it to move it close to the pin, or um, you know, just give yourself give yourself chances. Um, I think you obviously do have to put it in position off the tee, but I uh, I definitely think it's a second shot golf course. 
Well, right behind me, Mark 20. Hey, Matt, um, just, uh, could you describe what Pulse means to this European side and, and uh, have a follow-up on that? Yeah, I mean, everyone knows what, what Ian Pult is about. Um, I think I didn't play. He wasn't on the team that I played in in 2016. He was a vice captain. Um, and j he, I've already noticed that there's kind of a different feeling having him play on the team. Um, I think he kind of just almost, I don't know, to, I don't know what the word is, but he kind of just gives you confidence. You know, he, he, you sort of see how he interacts with the crowd. You see how he goes about his days. You know, he's very, very switched on. He knows what, knows what to do. He's done plenty of these now. And, um, I think for me, it, it's being around him has kind of helped me, you know, feel bit more confident going into the week as well so that's always a positive if, if can you place yourself on the other side and, and imagine being an opponent when he gets on those rolls where he's going nuts and the bug eyes and the whole thing and 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 what kind of an effect that has if you're an opponent of his and he's on that roll yeah i mean when when he's holding putts from everywhere you just want to throw him in the lake i'm sure um but he's uh yeah, you just don't want to face that. Um, he's uh, when he's on, he's a man on a mission. You know, he, he just he's pretty much unstoppable when he's doing that to you. So, um, you know, from my side, long may it continue this week. <laughs> okay, we're going to go over to Phil number five. Hi, Matt. Sorry to take you back to 2016 again, but I was just wondering, was the plan for you to play more if Europe hadn't lost the first session so heavily? Honestly, couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you, Phil. I, I, I no idea. <laughs> Fair enough. Short answer. <laughs> okay, right behind number seven. And Matt, kind of just to piggyback off that, one of the hardest things that a captain has to do is to tell four of the world's best players that they're not going to be teeing it up in a session. Just curious how that news was broken to you in in 2016 and how you and how you took it. I mean, listen, I I I, uh, I was a rookie. I didn't expect to be playing five matches. Um, Obviously, of course, I want to play five matches. You know, regardless of how how we're playing, I, I, you know, I wanted I wanted to be part of it and experience it. Um, but at the time, you know, disappointed, um, frustrated, really. But but you know, I look back now and and it it made sense. I, I look at the way I was I was hitting it at the time and um, compared to I look at myself now, it, it was very different and. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I've just accepted that. <laughs> I've just accepted that, you know, it, it, is, it was my first ever one. It was in America. It was around a golf course that did not suit me one bit. It kind of just adds up. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, back right. And hey, uh, hey, Matt, you mentioned uh, hitting it further nowadays and it making you a better player. I'm just curious how that helps you tackle a golf course like this now versus, say, like a shorter hitting version of yourself would have um shorter version i can hit driver everywhere so that's good now i'm hitting a few three woods so that's uh progress but um yeah i mean there's just obviously the a few holes that maybe they might move tees up that are drivable all of a sudden like it's i wouldn't say comfortable but i can drive it up by the green you know and and that makes a difference rather than i don't have to really get after it, it I can I can hit a normal one and it's going to be up there and um, you know make it easier for myself or my partner or whatever. Um, obviously, in in the past, holes like that, it's like I'm, I'm hitting a great drive and it's thirty forty yards short rather than up by the green. So um, there's a bit of that, and then and then also just being you know confident in in how straight I can hit it. Um, sort of has added speed in anyway you know the more confident I've, I've become I, I can get after it more and um hit more fairways and hitting it longer so and and just for reference how much ball speed do you think you gained um you know in your own head? i couldn't i couldn't tell i couldn't tell you I, I honestly couldn't tell you we didn't really sort of measure from the start but i mean last last week in florida i was pretty close to bryson at 175 <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was I was I was about that last week in Florida, but uh, that was 
that wasn't for that many. So it's, uh, yeah, not quite reaching those levels yet. <laughs> Back left, Doug, 2-4. Matt, the, uh, as much as you, you say you want to forget your week at, at Hazel Tyne. You keep bringing it up. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just curious if there was one um, experience or one lesson from there that you could apply to this week. I mean, it's not something that I can apply, but it's something that I definitely learn. Um, I, I would have liked to have played a four-ball match before my singles, just to play my own ball to see what it is like in competition. Um, obviously, then I, I played one foursomes um, on the Saturday morning. It's, you know, it's like the equivalent of playing nine holes, really, isn't it? So... Um, and there's no flow or rhythm to it, so you don't really, you never really get get what it's like. So that was the big thing I took away. Is like I made sure that you know if I ever played again, and I speak to the captain, I say, listen, I'm not saying you have to play me in a four ball. I'm just saying from experience, I feel like it would benefit me to to play a four ball just to have that experience to to you know feel what it's like going to be like Sunday with the the crowds and the pressure and um, get that experience. Thanks. Front right one, so go ahead. But talking about playing five matches, no, I mean five. So it looks like this golf course has a big like physical test, no? physical requirement. Do you think for some players or even for some caddies, it might be too much to ask them to play five rounds in three days? I mean, yeah, it's a good point. I think if, it, if it's, it's blown a gale all, all week, that's obviously added extra too. I mean, I know some of the climbs up to the tees and, and down to the greens and stuff that it's... It's a lot, particularly for the caddies. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think in terms of players n nowadays, most guys are great athletes. So, you know, I'd like to think you can can do 36 a day for, for two days and then play 18 on Friday. I know there's obviously so many added stresses with the crowd and emotions and um, everything else that comes with it. But, um, you know, I'd like to think that... that everyone really can, can kind of uh, get through that pretty kind of uh, easily. <laughs> we are with Terrell Hatton. Um, welcome to your second career, uh, Ryder Cup. Um, just want to ask you, um, where's there more comfort for you? Is, was it as a rookie on home soil in Paris uh, over there uh, in Europe or being a more of an established player here on the road, where, where did you feel more comfortable as you came into the Ryder Cup experience? Uh, well, I think I've seen two different places in in my career. Um, see, Paris was um, an amazing experience, um, and I was obviously pleased to to make this Ryder Cup team to, I guess, prove to myself that I can wasn't like a once off um, and it's a it's a special team to be a part of and we're looking forward to the week ahead all right let's hit the uh, floor for you for some questions I guess we'll start right here at number 20 mark hi Terrell um, with regard to Pultz, uh you as a pretty emotional player I'm curious what how you view him and and kind of what makes him tick and what he means to the team if we're all these done in the Ryder Cup yeah, he's obviously a huge, huge part of Team Europe. Um, obviously, very passionate and has a has a great Ryder Cup record. Um, and like I said, yeah, he's a, he's a massively important part of this team. If you were an opponent of his, can you imagine how you know when he gets on those rolls and he's dropping those long putts and whatnot, how that can affect the other side to some degree? Maybe get under its skin or whatever, you know, for lack of a better way. Well, I think momentum in match play is, is a huge thing and um, moments like that kind of can turn the match around or or kind of get you going on to hopefully win a point. So uh, Pulse has been very good over the years at holding a chip shot at a certain time or, you know, a long putt and maybe turning the match or um, sort of taking it on to, to win that point. So... Um, that's something that we all need to try and do this week, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely be trying our best to do that. Straight across, number three. A quick one. Uh, do you know exactly when you're going to play your first match and exactly who it's going to be with, without naming names, of course? And if the answer is yes, how early did you know that? Uh, I think 
the, the guys have been told. Um, Paddy told us, was it maybe yesterday, I think, or the, the day prior, um, just so that we all know kind of where we're at and um, we know what we're doing. We're going to go back right, number 11, David. Over here, Tyrrell. Hi. Okay. So there's been a little bit of speculation that you might be uh, a target for um, some of the crowds here, but is, is there a sort of comfort that nobody here could ever be as hard on you as you are on yourself? <laughs> That's probably very true. Um, I'm not sure exactly what... Um, kind of re reception I'll get tomorrow um, as we're the the away team I think we all expect a little bit of um, well n not not really any cheers so um, we, we'll take it in our stride um, and um, see how we go and this thing of being uh, down on yourself at times is it easier to pull out of that when you've got a partner with you who's going to say no come on it's only one hole or whatever. So does that then become easier to over overcome it? Oh, well, I think f for me, um, you know, I I can't kind of... Well, for me personally, I, I can't really do that this week because it's almost not fair on your partner. Like You don't want to then essentially almost bring them down. And that's not what we're about. It's not what you do as a team. Um, you're in it together and... Uh, Obviously, you support one another and um, go out there and, and try and play as well as you can. We're going to go to number seven, same neighborhood there. Hey, Terrell. Um, I'm curious, when you're on the course, how often do you like change your game plan based on what your partner's doing? Um, for instance, like, are you hitting more to more conservative targets if your partner's in trouble, <coughs> you know, foursomes versus four balls? Like, how, how fluid is your plan and does it change a lot? Uh, I think it all depends what the situation of the matches and, and things like that. Um, I think at the end of the day, you just you still have to go out and play your own game. Um, if you're naturally a more aggressive player, then sometimes shying away from from that, you, you're not going to hit as good a shot as you as you could. Um, I think you just have to try and be true, true to yourself, play your own game. Um, and Yes, I guess you, you, you do need to be a little mindful at certain points in the match, but generally just go out there and, and just do what you'd normally do. Again, back right, number 12. Hi, Gerald. Um, have you spoken, you mentioned it about, you know, <coughs> clearly the crowd will be extremely partisan. Have you spoken as a team about how or if you should react to the crowd, you know, um, in terms of, you know, hushing them, in terms of reacting to... What, what 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 they do? Have you have you all spoken together and said right? Well, this is you know, keep calm and keep the lid in it. Um, I mean we've spoken a little bit, but I think at the end of the day you kind of go out there and we we're we're true to ourselves as as our own individual people, and I guess what you'd you'd sort of how you'd behave um, any other week. And yeah, we're not, uh, I wouldn't say gonna be like, aggressive if that's what you're asking. <laughs> Front left, Jeff uh, 19. Drew, I would guess as a young player, you aspire to be part of this European Ryder Cup uh, dynamic. Once you're there as you were in Paris, what, what's the biggest thing you pull from being part of that? Uh, I guess for me, that I, I'm good enough to be here. Um, the fact that I've made two teams now is 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 good for me as as a individual and how my own thought process kind of works. Um, and yeah, as obviously growing up watching the Ryder Cup and certain members on on our team that you've idolised, and now you're sharing a team room with them, and obviously it makes it very special. Number eight, across the way here. Tyrrell, you're coming in off off back-to-back -back missed cuts, and I'm, I'm just curious, do you feel like form coming into the Ryder Cup 
carries over into the Ryder Cup at all, or is it is it so different with being match playing with a partner that it's it's kind of a, a new ball game? Well, I hope not. <laughs> 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 no, it's it's a different um, it's a different atmosphere out in the golf course. Um, you know, I, I'd like to think that generally, when under pressure, in in big tournaments in the past, that I've played good golf, and th this week's obviously shouldn't, is no different to that. It's it's big pressure each day, and generally over my career, I've, I think I've been able to play well in big moments. So I take confidence from that. Although my form hasn't been great coming into this week um, with the added pressure that comes into it. Hopefully that allows me to, to raise my game to where it needs to be to, to help this team. We're going to go back left number 27, Martin. How would you rank um, the Ryder Cup with the four majors? Uh, well, it's hard because golf is such an individual sport most of the time um, it's hard to kind of compare them I think the Ryder Cup is extremely special and the the bond that you create in the team room is is incredible really and you know we're all pulling in the same direction um, and to to be on on the team obviously in Paris to be on a winning Ryder Cup team obviously made it even better and um, I think it's, yeah, like I said, it, it's, it feels very different to any major. Okay, we have a special question coming from Scott. Good morning, Carol. Can you tell us about your trip to Asheville, North Carolina? <laughs> uh, well, that's where um, me and Emily got married earlier this year, and I basically drank my body weight in beer. So it's, uh, it's a cool place. Um, my uh, my waistline has not not looked good since, um, but obviously look forward to going back when we can. But now you're married. All right, Terrell, thank you. Uh, we are with uh, world number one, John Rahm. Uh, John, welcome to your second career Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, frequently through these interviews, we hear about uh, the reverence, uh, you know, um, the European side has for Seve and Jose Maria and such, but beyond your two countrymen, which are obvious answers, are there any other players as you were growing up, the, as you watched a Ryder Cup, um, beyond the two that you kind of uh, locked into and you know were kind of captured by their spirit and their fervor for the Ryder Cup? I think uh, one that is often, or often can be overlooked is Monty. You know, Monty had a, had a really good run in the Ryder Cup, especially in singles, right? Um, somebody who had a great career, who maybe was not the most vocal player out there, like maybe Seve was, but uh, got things done. He was a tough guy to beat. So I think uh, I think Monty is one of those that, that can be overlooked. Okay, thank you for that insight. Let's uh, start back right. That is number 11. Yep. Hi, John. Only your second Ryder Cup, but you're already uh, pretty much expected to be one of the leaders, certainly on the cars, aren't you? Are you ready to make that step up? <laughs> I mean, easy what, what kind of a player would I say if I say no? <laughs> right. So, yes, yes, I, I'm ready for that. It's it's a challenge I look forward to. Obviously, there's a lot of players in our team that have a lot of experience and know how to get it done. Uh, I'm ready to add my name into that into that group. Tell me a feeling that there was going to be extra responsibility on you, given obviously your position in the rankings. Yes and no. Uh, we have plenty of players in the team that are vocal enough, that have done this enough, that naturally will gravitate towards for guidance. So uh, I'm not going to actively go and just make myself, hey, I'm a leader now, because I don't have that massive of an ego. So in that case, uh, hopefully, like I've done so far this year, I let the clubs and the ball do the talking, and I leave the, the speeches and the leadership to the guys that have been doing this for a long time. John, right behind me, Mark Twenty. Hey, John. Can you uh, describe what what you believe Pulse means to this team and, uh, and what he's done over the years? On, you know, in this in this competition for you guys. 
Well, I think Pultz is one of those players that you might get once in a generation, right, that embody the, the spirit of the Ryder Cup, right? He, you have somebody who, world ranking-wise, it's from 40, 50. You know, you wouldn't say world ranking or stats-wise is anything, you know, massively special. But when he steps through the doors and you get to the Ryder Cup, it is Ian Poulter. He's got a pretty good record, and he's a tough guy to beat. It's match play, and it's something special. And uh, that's the beauty of this team, and that's the beauty of this event, and that's the, the beautiful part of something and somebody like Ian Poulter. Uh, they really become somebody this week. But just as a follow to that, can you put yourself on the other side? Um, can you put yourself on the other side of, of as an opponent? And, and when he gets on those rolls that he's gotten on, you know, with the eyes and the, you mm -hmm. know, Fist pumps and the long yeah, when you get possessed, yeah, exactly possessed. <laughs> uh, how, how how rattling or maybe under the skin can that be for an opponent? Do you think in your? In your I wouldn't opinion? want to play Ian. That's not in that, especially in that mode. Like we saw in Medina, that's because uh, you have somebody who's a very good putter who will make the putt at the right time, and even though, like I said, might not look like anything special, he's not going to make any mistakes and he's going to hold on to that match and just be there and be relentless, and that's the worst type of opponent. He's, uh, he's a hard, tough man to beat, and, you know, it's a great guy. It's one of those guys in other sports that you may hate him if he's not on your team, but you love him if he's on yours. Thank you. I think number five. Yeah. Hey, John, what, I know there's still the Ryder Cup, but when you look at the season that you just <laughs> completed, it, there was a lot of stuff. There mm -hmm. was a lot going on. How do you – sum that up or you know <laughs> how do you reflect about that you know it's not the first time I answer this question and it just dawned on me that it's only been five and a half months since my son was born and there's been so many things that happened since then it almost feels like it's been a couple of years worth of experiences in in those five months and besides the setbacks that I've already talked about extensively um the good moments, the, the great experiences, the happiness vastly outweighs the setbacks. And that's all I can say about this year. You know, I've had, became a dad. You know, we're in a really good place family-wise. I'm very happy at home. It's, it's been amazing. Got my first major and played really good golf all year round. Uh, I have nothing to complain. It's, it's been amazing. No matter what happened COVID-wise, no matter what events I missed or what could have been, still has been an amazing year that I'm really thankful for. And... I think that's the most important thing, right? I feel like it's very easy in life to focus on what could have been and what you didn't have. Uh, but, you know, I'm choosing to just realize how many good things have happened and forget about those moments. Does that kind of perspective or does that possibly give you some perspective coming into an event like this that a lot of people view as, you know, the biggest thing ultra important super important obviously you want to win but it kind we of do we off. do want to win but it's a team effort right it's not like i can do it by myself uh unless you're polter he can do it by himself so uh <laughs> it's it would be a really nice end to to the year right uh, even though we've already started the new season technically uh it'll be a very nice end to what's been a wonderful year right um that win in fair in france you know you create a bond that it's unforgettable and it would be, you know, a really good feeling to be able to do it on first try, in, in my case, on in, in U.S. soil as well. So it's uh, it's something we all want to add to the calendar. It's something we all want to add to the repertoire, right, being able to win a Ryder Cup, especially in, in a way, a way country. Straight across, uh, number three. Hey, John, from what you've seen so far, um, what are the biggest differences in temperament and captaining style between Thomas and Parik? Hmm. Don't know if my, my vice captain will let me disclose too much. <laughs> uh, well, I must say, I didn't know either of them that much before the Ryder Cup. Obviously, I've been a pro for a couple of years only when it happened in Paris, and I'm predominantly on the PJ Tour. So I don't see Thomas, I didn't see Thomas that much or Padraig. Um, you can say, uh, the only thing I must say, <laughs> Padraig is a lot more calm than, than Thomas was. Uh, Am I right on that? 
A little bit, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I feel like that's a better question for a vice captain because I think they, they see and hear a lot more of the reality, cause, right? The captain needs to be calm, cool, and composed for all the players, right? It can't be going off in all of us. So uh, <laughs> we might not see the whole the whole truth. Uh, but obviously, they've both been very, uh, very well spoken and what they very well expressive on what they have in mind, what they expect from us. And uh, it's, you know, they've made it very easy and very comfortable for all of us. They've, do they've done a really good job at, at just letting us do what we have to do and just letting each one of us know, especially in my case, what they expect from me and what they want me to do. And, and that's, that's been wonderful. Quick follow-up. I know you can't name names, obviously. How early did you know when you were playing first and who you were playing with? Wait, what do you want? What do you mean? How early were you to given that information of who you're going to play with? Yeah, who you're going to play with tomorrow and that. Well, I still don't know, so you tell me. I think like you guys think we know a lot more than you guys know. I mean, I have an idea of a couple of players I may play with. Uh, I mean, didn't you guys see us throwing balls in the tee yesterday? I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> well, here you go. That's how we do things. Just leave it out to chance. <laughs> Straight back, uh, 26 in. Hey, John, can you talk about the transition going from golf as an individual sport to golf as a team sport, what the transition's like for you? Honestly, it's great. And it's, it's something that for some reason for all of us becomes quite easy. Uh, I think because we have so much of individual golf where for the most part you only care about yourself. A lot of the decisions in life and even at home I've made do the golf and what we need to do to become the better players. When you get here, it's not just about yourself, right, uh, or your family. It's it's about all 12 of us. And to be fair, a lot of the decisions are made for us. It's a lot easier. <laughs> but uh, it is really cool to see all these great players, the people that have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I mean, Christ, when Lee played the Ryder Cup for the first time, I wasn't even three years old yet. And to see all these great people that have accomplished so many things come together with a smile that only a team event in the Ryder Cup can bring to you, an excitement, a juvenile excitement that you don't usually expect a 48-year-old to have. It's, it's very unique, and it's something that I wish everybody could see because I feel like a lot of times we're missing that in life, and what, a week like this can definitely give you that youth back in that sense um, me mentally, right? And even though I'm still 26, uh, I'm very young, still takes me back to when I was a kid hoping to be playing in the Ryder Cup, when I was a kid representing Spain and how I felt back then. And obviously magnified times, you know, 100 in this, in this situation. But it's, it's something that uh, it's very, very fun. It's what makes the Ryder Cup so special amongst other things, right? I mean, we're all one and we're all the same and we all have the same level of excitement. And the smiles that we see around and the happiness and the joy is something that, again, I wish everybody could see. Far left, 22. Hi, John. You're um, world number one in the U.S. national champion. Is, is that? Does that? Do you take? How do you balance uh, taking confidence from that, or against the pressure it might put on you? And as a, a quick, quick second part, or unrelated, have you ever actually met Monty? I have met Monty. God, I can't say when, but I have met him uh, quickly in passing. Um, I remember. Not meeting him, but I remember I watched him finish the last two holes in Valderrama. I think it was 09 on uh, the Volvo Masters, uh, amongst many other players. Paul Casey and Stenson signed my shirt. There's a picture that came around a couple of years ago. So um, I remember watching him then. Uh, and if anything, being a major champion this year on a tough setup, it just it should give you confidence, right? Uh, at the same time, it's match play. It's different. Tomorrow morning, foursomes. Right, so or four balls, so you're playing with a partner, it's not individual anymore. So it is a little bit of a different game, but at the same time, you got to do try your best, right? In that sense, it's the same thing. So, um, if anything, just gives me confidence in that sense that uh, I know what I'm capable of. All right, we've got three minutes left, one question each. Let's go to six. John, it's a pretty demanding golf course, obviously, and the, the cold and wind can, can wear down on anybody. How do you prepare your body and mind for the possibility of going all five this week? Well, I'm, I'm physically ready for it, you know. Uh, I know I look like it, but I train every day when I'm at home, uh, believe it or not. 
And I'm, I'm in really good shape in that sense. I have no problem walking 36. Um, I feel like the biggest challenge on an event like this is possibly five rounds of the men mental aspect of it. And that's where I think you need to learn to really unwind quickly and get ready when you need to, right? Uh, and I mean on the golf course as well. You can't be 100% focused locked in for five hours because that is mentally draining. You got to learn how to, you know, switch off a little bit, have a bit of fun with your partner and the caddies, and then when you need to hit the shot, be ready and in there, right? So it's a bit of things. Uh, also, when you get to the team room after the round, practice round, whatever it is, everybody's having such a good time that that in itself is a great rest. Now, in my case, the most important things outside of all that would be hydrating properly and getting enough sleep. Those two things are going to be the keys this week as well. So uh, throughout the week, make sure you sleep enough and, and you're letting your body recover and hydrate to make sure that recovery is even better. Okay, last English question here, then we'll do a few Spanish. Go ahead. When did, John, when did this competition really begin to matter to you? And then the second part is the video that came out out of context from Team Europe. Is that an accurate depiction of how you celebrated <laughs> in 2018? <laughs> no, but that's what they want me to do this year if we were, if it were to happen. Um, I mean, it's not what I did. I can tell you the environment is not too far from that. Okay, now nobody was on tables shirt off. I certainly wasn't. Um, but it's the environment is, is somewhat similar. Some people were going just as hard uh, that night celebrating, which I don't blame them. You know, it's a stressful long year. And like I said earlier, when you're in an environment with no judgment, you're not scared of anybody posting it on Instagram. Uh, you can let yourself go a little bit and be vulnerable. And that's a fun part out of things like that. And then when did this event? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know exactly the age, uh, but it's been on my radar for a very long time. You know, I think when you're born in Spain, the Ryder Cup is something special. You know, there's a lot of legacy in this event be between Seve, Ali, and the players got the most amount of Ryder Cup points for Team Europe in history, right? It's, uh, it's a lot to live up to. I'm not going to lie. It's uh, a lot of uh, expectation when you're a Spaniard, but that just means, right? I mean, a lot of times we're called a different word for passionate. But I think that's when all this great emotions can be used in match play. And that's why, as a general, people have done great. So for a very long time, I've been looking forward to being a Ryder Cup player. And, and it still is something you have in mind every day, right? I mean, uh, especially while you're approaching. Obviously, we have a lot of individual events going on. But, you know, uh, when the topic comes up, it is something. Can't explain it, but it's very unique. Okay, Juan, you want to ask him two quick ones? Espanol? Okay. Not a one. Bueno, contar un poco las diferencias principales y que es entre París y aquí, tanto como jugador como personalmente, y sí. luego el contexto, ¿no? Creo que somos menos de 10 españoles, incluyendo a Kepa, ¿no? <risa> a ver, el, el, hay diferencias, ¿no? Lo primero, no soy novato, ¿no? No es mi primera rider, la segunda, sé un poco, sé lo que va a ser la dinámica de la semana, más o menos, qué compromisos tenemos, qué, no te, qué compromisos no tenemos, y digamos cómo manejar mi tiempo, ¿no? eh, organizarme mejor. Y eso es algo muy importante, que la primera raida la verdad no sabía. No, no sabía cuántos compromisos de verdad íbamos a tener. Eh, y luego, bueno, a ver, en esa era mi primer año, pero también estaba, creo, número tres del mundo. En esta es mi segunda, que digamos es relativamente pronto, pero estoy como número uno después de haber ganado grande. ¿no? Así que como persona hay mucha diferencia. He aprendido mucho, he crecido mucho. Y... Y bueno, me veo un poco más preparado para ello. Eh, no menos, un poco menos intimidado, pero con muchísimas ganas a la vez. ¿no? Al final es, es una semana muy bonita, muy única. Y muchas reservas, por supuesto, y cautela con el tema de los emparejamientos, que se entiende perfectamente. Sí, bueno, pero, porque ahí no, no podemos hablar no, del no, tema. Por supuesto, pero eh, sí que hay que hablar de los puntos fuertes de Sergio y qué sería el punto fuerte de una pareja John-Sergio. ¿no? ¿Cómo funcionaría eso? Yo creo que el punto más fuerte es la garra y el, la conexión española, ¿no? Al final somos dos que nunca nos damos por vencidos, que vamos a luchar cada golpe y con cierta imaginación en el campo, ¿no? Que eso en match play es difícil de debatir, especialmente en un día bueno. Ahora, puntos fuertes de Sergio, pues que de tía Green es un robot, no falla una, <ríe> así que yo encantado. Y no es que yo sea alguien que de tía Green le vaya mal, ¿no? Así que es... Somos dos jugadores muy buenos de Tia Green que en un campo como este, en estas condiciones, pues puede ser muy difícil debatir, ¿no? Pero yo creo que nuestro punto más fuerte es, es esa garra, esa determinación que, 
que nos viene un poco únicos, ¿no? Esa, como en español diríamos, un poco de mala hostia. We are joined by European Captain Patrick Harrington. Uh, Patrick, we have, um, we have pairings and now we have matchups too. Um, maybe an overarching thought on, on the, the four uh, teams you put forth and, and, and what you see in the matchups that will go off tomorrow morning. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the team I've put out there. Uh, strong, experienced team. I did have 12 players that could play foursomes, uh, so probably that it was a pretty tough decision to, to have to rest for. It wasn't a, it wasn't a very easy uh, decision. I think uh, it was pretty clear to me where we were going, though. Uh, very happy with my partnerships I've put out there, and uh, clearly it's interesting when you see the matchups. We, we would have been aware that uh, JT and Jordan would have, were going first, obviously, so uh, we were obviously going to lead ourselves with a strong partnership, uh, as you can see with John and Sergio. So I'm uh, sure the whole world would be watching that one. Uh, you know, after that, you know, we got the Victor Hovland, rookie. What a great player, what a great guy. Uh, equally matched up with Paul Casey, strong player over the years. Not really necessarily thinking that we're we're going there for an experienced guy with a, with a rookie. We we Victor is in a nice place, but two strong players together. Uh, obviously Lee and and, and Matt, uh, you know both from the same town at home. Uh, two strong players. Matt himself a great match player, uh, playing great, and Lee you know a stalwart beside him uh, with the experience. I like I like the way that they've come out together, played together, and I feel. Uh, I feel pretty strongly about that, and obviously everybody would have predicted the last one. I assume that wasn't too hard. Rory and, and Ian uh, played well in the past, uh, probably going up against their new young guns. Uh, you know, Patrick and Alexander look like a partnership that they may be looking for for the future, uh, going against an established partnership of ours. Okay, thank you. Let's hit the floor. Shane, uh, number three. Patrick, uh, I thought it was very interesting that all four of your pairs only played together in the practice rounds one out of three days. Uh, that's highly unusual, uh, not just for U Amer European teams, for American teams, for anyone. Can you explain the uh, thought process there? We knew our partnerships well in advance. Uh, picks, where we knew our partnerships with picks, and all that was considered. You know, you, you don't want to get bored playing with a guy. Honestly, you know, I, I've had it in, pra in, in tournaments. You play three days with somebody and then you're playing with them the next five, four rounds of golf. That can be really tough. Uh, I want everybody in my team to, to play with everybody in the team to, you know, not turn up in a week like this and, and by the end of the week go, oh, I, I never saw a player. I never experienced that player and, you know, I never got to see what they were like in this situation. So I was very keen on the players to... Uh, to mix with each other and to get the full experience of the other 11 players in the team. Um, I knew the partnerships were looking after themselves. That yes, they have to trial foursomes, and they did have, have a go at the foursomes and uh, you know, made sure that they're comfortable with which tee shot they're hitting and which ball they're hitting. Uh, they had enough of, of that, but I just didn't want them to overdo it. Uh, so I know I'm, the f I'm probably the first captain to do it like that, but it's certainly every captain has to bring their own personal experiences. And from my personal experience, uh, you know, you just, you want to turn up on Friday and still have that freshness and enthusiasm uh, and excitement and a little bit of, I suppose, a little bit of intrigue in the first, you know, when you're going out there. And then a quick follow-up, uh, you hinted at it. How soon did all these players know about these matchups? When did they learn them? I, I would think the earliest ever, so very early. Uh, they're well aware of what the what they were doing early on this week, and uh, uh, yeah, it's something players have have said they want to know. So I, I we knew. Uh, I probably told you these partnerships, uh, likely partnerships. Uh, you know, we've been working on these for for months, and um, when the team was was named a week ago, I will say I have twelve players that could play foursome. So yeah, there was there was no partnership. There was other partnerships that could have gone in there, but there was no surprises in terms of, of what we were, what we could do. Uh, we had plenty of options, and uh, you know, a strong possibility was you, you, we, we will mix and match our foursomes uh, going forward as well. Because as I said, we have we have 12 players who are very balanced, very strong all the way through, and uh, 
good ball strikers that can play both foursomes and four ball. Thank you. On your lower left, Jeff, 19. Patrick, you have a, a Matt Fitz, Fitzpatrick going out in the third game. You, you were an assistant in 16. He had a rough go. Can you just speak to the growth you've seen in him from that point to where he is now? Well, look, he, he's, he's always had it. Uh, I know he didn't have a very good week, a uh, comfortable week that week in 2016. Uh, you know, we had a tough week as a team. Uh, but Matt's been a, an underestimated player for whatever reason for the whole of his career. He continually delivers on a big stage. He is a great player, uh, does fantastic. Like, all the way back to he's a U.S. amateur champion. Uh, yes, seems to you know, get lost just because he's a quiet lad and a studious lad and, 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 you know, you know, works hard. I think he gets lost a little bit in the general media in the sense of, you know, there's not enough razzmatazz for, him. Uh, you know, if you look at his results and the way he plays, he's, he's great. Uh, and, you know, I, I've said it all along. I'm, I'm, I focus much more on, on the score the player does than anything else. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be all showy and fancy and all that. Matt is just a great, solid golfer. And, uh, yeah, always underestimated. And, you know, not not by me or his team, uh, but, you know, sometimes people just because you're not flashy, as you know, people don't seem to not think of him first at first point. Even there you were nearly struggling to get the name out. Like, he's been around a long time and is a winner. All right, right across here, the way, number six. Hi, Farik. Um, Steve Sticker was saying that uh, uh, nothing is going to, barring uh, injury or illness, nothing will change his plan for tomorrow afternoon. Um, is that yours as well, or are you going to watch how they go in the morning and maybe adjust things, your, maybe adjust your plan for the four balls? No, I, I think we're pretty set, yeah. Uh, I, I, would, I would know my plan for tomorrow all the way through. I, players are aware of that plan and uh, clearly we don't put the team onto late morning because things can happen anything can happen that's that's slightly I won't say unknown but slightly unknown at this stage but uh, we will be very set in what we're doing and it would take a take a lot for us to change our mind we're going to go to Alex on 20 right behind me Patrick um, you've been a vice captain numerous times has the pairings part of this and when you told players changed from the first time you were vice captain till now? Mm. Certainly changed since the first time I was a player. Uh, you know, I know my first one I found out, you know, just before the opening ceremony on the Thursday that I was playing Friday morning. Uh, that was kind of a, somebody had pulled out sort of thing, so that was a little bit different. Uh, but I think... Uh, we have tried over the years to, to, to be as early as possible with given the, the, the information and I do believe this is the earliest this week for us. Uh, I got it out there early because you know we were very comfortable. As I said, this is an interesting team for Europe. It's very strong and balanced, you know, all the way through. Uh, you know, and, and foursomes wise, it's very balanced, so and clearly in four ball wise. So it's it's not like it's uh, we had plenty to you know sit down and work with, and and it was you know it was a very fair way of putting out the team, and and the players responded to that. They're they're comfortable knowing uh, when and where they're going to play, and and uh, you know they've responded very nicely to that. Because of, because of that balance, could you foresee playing anybody five? matches this week? Yeah, look, it, 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 yeah, absolutely. You know, you, 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 you get a guy out there winning. Yeah, you, you can push him a bit too hard. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a, it is a possibility that players will play five times. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be off the cards, no. But, you know, maybe ideal, in an ideal world, you, you wouldn't do that. We are going to beam out to Ian Slattery. Ian, you're with the European captain. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Patrick. Um, with Lee Westwood and Matt Fitzpatrick both playing Pro V1Xs, and 
Hovland and Casey both playing Pro V1s. They're, they're both playing the same balls as their partners. Was that part of the reasoning um, of their choice on top of their obvious qualities? And a second question, is there any truth in the rumour you've ordered Packers jerseys and ditched the uniforms for the lads tomorrow after Steve Stricker's uh, Chicago Bears admission? <laughs> uh, golf ball-wise, yes. Yeah, it was a clear part of it. it, it, it players are interesting. It, it depends on lots of players. can. And, and by the way, there's no one-ball rule anymore in foursomes, so they have, they have made it a lot easier. Uh, so you can mix and match their golf ball as you go along. But uh, it certainly makes it easier if both players are using the same ball. Uh, but it also depends on the player himself. Some players uh, you know, have good history and might have used another ball at some stage and are happy to change other players. You know, might not necessarily have that in their head. So you, it's strongly considered what golf ball is being uh, used by the players and something you have to be very aware of, aware of when you're looking at a partnership. And uh, we, uh, we might recycle their our lovely outfits from uh, yesterday, the Green Bay Packer-esque ones. Look forward to that. Let's beam out again. Adam Shupak, go ahead, sir. You're with, you're with Captain Hi, Harrington. Greg. Adric, given that you said that uh, you feel your team's very balanced, that they, you, know, you could put so many different lineups out there, is it safe to say that, that all 12 of your players will play tomorrow? It would be... It would be an unknown, uh, like an unknown event if that didn't happen. Like clearly, yeah, something that I can't predict right now. So we put the team in late tomorrow morning, and we do that for a reason because obviously we have to look at, at all scenarios. But the, I, I, I can't con contemplate a reason, bar, you know, I don't know, illness or COVID or something like that. But everybody will will play, uh, and everybody is ready to play, and they have been ready for that for. Uh, the last three days. Going out again to Scott Mishaw. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Patrick. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, you've put all of your most experienced players out in that first session. How much was that by design? Yeah, we've gone with an experienced setup. Yeah, no doubt about it. But it was it was our strong setup. It just happened to be experienced. Uh, so yeah, you, you know, I was happy with that. There's no doubt when it when it when it came out like that, and you're looking at it and you go, yeah, that's very experienced. That is a, a is a is a big bonus, but it was also a, a very strong setup. Uh, but it didn't weaken our four balls. That was very important. Uh, you know, we still we still have a strong four ball setup, and we haven't taken from the afternoon by going with a strong setup in the morning. Let's stay in the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Scott. Follow. Up. No, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's stay in the room and let's go to Brian Eight. Yeah, Padraig, can you just, uh, I don't know if you've touched on it, talk about the importance of the first session in a, in a Ryder Cup on, on the Friday morning and um, maybe a little bit on the, the reason for your ordering of the, of the, of the score pairing. Uh, look, the first session on the importance of it is decided after the result. That's the way it goes, you know. The the team that goes out there and, and and gets a lead will say momentum is everything, and the team that doesn't will have to will have to find another way. So uh, we in a perfect world, you would like to go out there, uh, win the session, win it well, and and lead from the front and keep going. Uh, we don't get that choice. We've got to go out and earn it. Uh, we put out a strong foursomes group. Yes, uh, as regards the the sort of. Uh, positioning of the matches the only one we would have been aware of would have been JT and Jordan and we've got a very strong pairing in that match uh, you know outside of that you know clearly Rory and, and Pulse were a, a pairing that were predicted and I, I suppose if anything we could kind of just split those up from the, the, the first group there at the end and, and we've, uh, we've two lovely pairings in the middle so you know it's just a nice way. But we weren't too focused. Prior to that first match where we would have been aware, we weren't too focused on, on who they were going to come up against or, or how, how that was going to pan out. Just to follow up, was there something you saw in, in Rory and, and, and Ian in Paris a couple of years ago that encouraged you to put them together again? Oh, absolutely. They, they, they played lovely there. They, they, they work very nicely on this golf course. Both of them are in good form. So... Yeah, I, it, it, it was a partnership. We came here 
that you would have always had in your head and then you know when you when you match it up on this golf course you show yeah this is this is a, a running certainty uh, from early in the week let's go over to jeff lower left 19. Hedrick, john rahm is in here earlier today talking about the great spanish heritage in this event uh, and what it's meant how, how long have you been thinking about putting that pairing together with sergio it, it's been it's been there a good while yes um, it's something both of them really want. Uh, I think uh, they're both at a nice place in in their careers now. That you know, it, it is interesting when you match up countrymen. Uh, I know. I would say this. I started off playing with Paul McGinley in the World Cup back in the day, and we we won it in '97, and he was just a great partner, captain. But as I progressed as a player, there was a period where we just weren't a great partnership anymore. Uh, there wasn't a clear leader in it uh, i think with with john and 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 sergio it really they really have looked at this they've matured themselves over the last couple of years into a beautiful position uh you know uh where you know it is the Ryder cup of course where sergio is, is you know he's the experienced one he's leading out there and and, he, and he, he he knows he's playing with the world number one uh you know fantastic for both of them and they, they really uh, very, very comfortable that they're going to get the most best out of both, both of them, both of their games. Right behind me, Alex, yeah. 20. Patrick, um, if you, we make a lot of the matchups between the Americans and your team. If you would have known what the matchups were beforehand, would you have changed anything? No, you can't, you can't really focus on the opposition. You know, you've got to concentrate on what your team is doing. Uh, I'm happy with what I see on paper. You know, we, as I said, we did know JT and Jordan were likely to lead out. Uh, so, you know, and we want a strong start ourselves. Uh, that That is an interesting match, but you got to focus on your own team, your own players, and, and, and be comfortable that no matter who they come up against, they will do the job. Captain, we're going to wrap it up right here on three. Well, Patrick, um, Tommy Fleetwood, obviously 4-0 in pairs in Paris. Got to be tough to leave a guy like that out. How hard was it, and That's, how did he react? That says a lot about our team. Uh, you know, uh, very much says a lot about our team, that he is comfortable uh, after going 4-0 in the matches, that, you know, he's not there in the foursomes the, the first morning. He, he can look around his team and be confident that there's other people taking up that strain. Uh, and he is prepared to sit there and wait his chance in the afternoon. Uh, which really does sums up our team, how, how balanced it is and how comfortable and the understanding of the players that, you know, that they have to uh, give other people their opportunity as well. I, I want every player in my team absolutely dying to play every match, but I want them to also understand that there's other people in their team. They, they have to step aside, and they've done that brilliantly. They're in, they're in a very nice place that they know what they're doing. They're ready to go and uh, very comfortable uh, that their teammates are going to pull their weight and that everybody will, will do their job this week. Thank you. Captain, you've reached Ryder Cup Eve. Uh, have a good evening, and we look forward to seeing your team tomorrow. Thank you.